happy, he says, are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. You could render it harassed. Happy are those who are harassed for righteousness' sake. Make sure you note that here in this text. Jesus Christ does not say, happy are those who create a nuisance of themselves. Happy are the unethical. Happy are the sloppy. Happy are the irritating. Happy are the arrogant. No. Happy are the harassed who are harassed because they live a godly life. Have you ever been in the role of a peacemaker? Being a peacemaker isn't easy because it often involves getting in the middle of messy things. When people are in conflict, emotions are high and relationships can be strained. But helping resolve conflict is part of how God has called us to live. Welcome to this broadcast of Wisdom for the Heart with Stephen Davey. Stephen's working through a section of Matthew 5 known as the Beatitudes. This is the fifth and final message in this series, and Stephen's calling today's lesson, Happy are the Harassed. A man knew his wife's birthday was just around the corner, and so he asked her without appearing to be you know, too interested in, in knowing, He asked her, honey, if if you could have one wish, what would you want? She thought a moment and laughed and then said, I'd love to be eight again. On the morning of her birthday, he got up and got her ready. They went to a nearby waffle house for waffles and whipped cream with a tall glass of milk. Next, they headed to the local theme park. What a day they had there. He put her on every ride in the park, the death slide, the cyclone whip, the screaming loop, the wall of fear. And on and on. Everything they had, she rode. Five hours later, she staggered out of the theme park with her husband, her head reeling, her stomach still churning. But off to McDonald's they went, where he ordered her a Big Mac with fries and a thick chocolate milkshake. After that, they went to the latest Disney animated movie where they had popcorn and Pepsis and a bag of M&Ms topping off the day full of fabulous eight-year-old adventures. Exhausted, she stumbled into the house Late that evening with her husband collapsed on the bed, he leaned over and softly whispered, well, honey, how'd you like being eight again? One eye opened in surprise and she moaned, I meant my dress size. (laughs) You know, it's one thing to think we heard somebody and it's another thing to really understand (laughs) what they meant. Isn't it typical, though, for us to say things to to people like, oh, I I thought you said that. Or I I thought when you said that, you you meant this. When I heard you say that, I, I, I didn't think you meant that, so I didn't do anything about it. I mean, how many husbands have said to their wives, I didn't hear you say that? And how many wives have said, I can't believe you're saying you didn't hear me say that? These are all hypothetical illustrations here. (laughs) Without a doubt, everybody has an opinion on what they think God says about just about everything. Certainly on what pleases him and what would be the path that would bring from him this elusive attribute of happiness. If you do this, God will be pleased with you and you will be happy. If you don't do that, God will be pleased with you and you will be happy. If you don't do this or that, God won't be pleased with you and you won't be happy. Is God really that confusing on the subject of happiness? Well, I have found it fascinating that as Jesus Christ began his very first sermon recorded for us, he could have said a lot of things about a lot of things. But he began by clearing up the truth about happiness and the Christian life. With nine statements each beginning with the word makarios, happiness, true, genuine, abiding happiness. Jesus Christ radically redefines a life of true happiness. And we have uncovered in the process of our study the principle that dying to self is certainly the first and ongoing step toward happiness. 
we have uncovered in the process that these blesseds, these beatitudes, you could render it, these happinesses are the opposite of me attitudes, aren't they? Because they really have nothing to do with me. In fact, the death of me brings happiness. Dying to self brings abiding happiness. So Jesus Christ has laid it out for us and defined a path for us in Matthew chapter 5 by radically upending conventional religious wisdom. What the religious leaders and people of Christ's day thought God said was radically different than what God meant. So don't misunderstand what God is saying. Let's find out in one more session together. Let's pick our study back up by going then to verse 9 where we left off. Happy, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. There it is. Happy are the peacemakers. Would you notice that Jesus Christ does not say, happy are the peaceful. Happy are the undisturbed. That's what we would write. I've had a great week. Why? Nobody disturbed me. I'm feeling really happy. Why? Everything's peaceful. Jesus Christ did not say, happy are the peaceful. In fact, he uses a compound word, peacemaker. The first half of the word meant much the same thing as the Hebrew word shalom. The Hebrew or Jew would say shalom. They meant much more than, well, you know, have a nice day. They literally meant wholeness. Be whole. Have well-being. It wasn't just have a nice and peaceful life or day. It was a blessing for them to have a whole life. The second part of the word, maker, peacemaker, demands that we understand that the person is not passive, but literally someone who negotiates peace. By the way, would you notice as well, that the Christian who is the peacemaker, he said, is someone who is called sons of God. And would you notice as well that the peacemakers are not given the promise of peace. They're given the promise that they will be like their father. Peacemaking can mess up your world. A godly person might stir up trouble. You might not have had so much trouble, but since you've become a Christian... Everywhere the Apostle Paul went, Warren Wiersbe said, he either stirred up a revival or a riot. You just might have war on your hands. The cross of Jesus Christ, by the way, is the greatest example of making peace. And it costs the life of the peacemaker, right? Instead of glossing over sin, peacemakers, by the way, don't sacrifice truth along the way. The Lord, in fact, openly exposed sin, bore sin, suffered for sin, and his death brought us peace. Paul wrote, therefore, being justified by faith, we have what? Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, Romans chapter 5, verse 1. There wasn't anything cheap. There wasn't anything easy about this peace. Christ literally made peace for us. Paul used, by the way, the same root words for Christ making peace that Christ used in Matthew 5 for peacemakers. Same root word. It will cost you. It will require that you and I die to self. Every time you share the gospel, by the way, of Jesus Christ with uh, someone else, did you know you are engaged in, in peacemaking? The world is in deep, deep trouble at this very moment. And whether they realize it or not, they are an enemy of God. They are at enmity with God, means they are the enemy of God. Can you imagine being the enemy of God? Paul wrote to the Corinthians, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you... On behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. Now, I have made some enemies because of my testimony. How about you? You ever had anybody tell you off? Ever had anybody tell you, who do you think you are? You think you're better than me? And all you've tried to do is share with them that Christ loves them. You, you telling me I'm a sinner? 
Now, that doesn't mean we grab people by the nap of the neck and, you know, make them repeat, I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. But eventually they realize as you share the gospel with them that that's what you're saying they are. And that becomes offensive. You ever had a door slammed in your face? You ever been promoted over because you wouldn't laugh it up with the boys? You ever been ridiculed on the campus for your testimony? You see, standing up as a son of God may mean you stand alone. So when you deliver the gospel, just remember you are a peacemaker. But sometimes, sometimes it can really rough up the waters of your life. I'm in the middle of reading the biography of General Douglas MacArthur, great general of World War II, depending on who you're reading. And the Japanese soldiers had uh, dug in over dozens and dozens of islands. And after the peace treaty had been signed, many of them had not received the news that the war was over. In fact, I read that it was about 15 years ago, if you can imagine this, 15 years ago, they believed they found the last Japanese soldier who for decades had been isolated, living on an island, thinking that the war must still be on, living in fear, not knowing peace had come. Equally tragic, I have read that the Japanese government enlisted messengers and sent them to to many of these islands to deliver the news of peace, and some of the messengers were shot and killed. There's a parallel here, though, isn't there? You might lose sleep if you become a peacemaker. You might ruffle feathers. You might make enemies. As you engage in the mess of people's lives, as you negotiate peace between people and between people and God, you might sacrifice peacefulness in order to make peace. But if you're willing to share not only in the power of his resurrection, but in the fellowship of his what? His sufferings, the sufferings of the Son of God, you, redeemed sons of God, will engage in delivering the news that peace with God is now available through Jesus Christ. I recommend to my uh, seminary students the small biography of Robert Chapman, the pastor of a small church his entire life in 19th century England. The man, however, was deeply respected, considered by many, including Charles Spurgeon, who once said that Robert Chapman is the saintliest man in England. Not everyone liked Robert Chapman because of his testimony, and that's just a fact of life. It was interesting, on one occasion, a grocer once became so infuriated by Chapman's open-air preaching that as he walked by him, he spit on him. For a number of years, this same grocer continued to verbally attack Robert Chapman every time he got near him. Chapman never retaliated. In fact, on one occasion, some of Chapman's wealthy relatives came to visit him. Robert was a single man his entire life. And they decided to to do some cooking for him to give him a little break while they visited. They asked where they could purchase groceries. And Chapman insisted that they go to this particular store. They did. And they purchased a large amount of food and then asked that it be delivered to the home of Robert Chapman. The grocer said, excuse me, that can't be you. you." No, that's right. Delivered to the home of Robert Chapman. Well, You must have come come to the wrong store. No, no, no. We came exactly to where he told us to to come. When the grocer arrived and Chapman answered the door, God used that singular event. And that grocer broke down into tears. Chapman's peacemaking effort ended in this grocer yielding his life that very afternoon to Jesus Christ. The final beatitude is repeated, you'll notice, and expanded in chapter 5, verses 10 to 12. In fact, Christ actually, I think, amplifies on the results of being peacemakers. Notice what Christ says in verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. 
Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Truly happy, he says, are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. The word translated persecuted has the idea of being chased, hunted. You could render it harassed. Happy are those who are harassed. For righteousness' sake. Jesus Christ says, happy are those who are hunted and harassed. Now notice, he he does say, for righteousness' sake. Okay? And when you pulled over because somebody behind you was flashing their blue lights for running that stoplight, you know, you don't get rewards in heaven. You're not persecuted by the state. Okay? You're not persecuted for righteousness' sake. When I was a kid, during the summertime, my friend and I would explore in some woods near our subdivision at night until it grew dark. I remember on many occasions, there was an apartment complex on our way home. On the bottom floor downstairs was the electrical box that ran all of the electricity for the entire apartment building, and it was controlled by a big handle. It even had a grip mark in that. And the temptation was, was great indeed, and, and we yielded. We'd scout around to make sure nobody was downstairs, and we'd, we'd pull that handle and run out of there as quick as we could as the entire building went dark. Well, the last time we ever did that, (laughs) two guys, one of them dressed in army fatigues, happened to be standing on the balcony just over where we ran underneath. They heard the electrical arm slam down. They saw their building grow dark and two kids sprint out from underneath their balcony. And all I can remember was running as fast as I could and I heard, hey you. And as I was sprinting, I looked behind me and one of those guys, the guy in army fatigues, had leapt over the balcony, landed on the ground like Sylvester Stallone. And took off after us. If we had not outrun them, you would have a different pastor. God knew I needed to live. That's all I can say. You need to understand the difference between punishment and persecution. If we had been caught, we would not have been persecuted. We would have been tortured to death. Probably. We'd have been punished. Make sure you note that here in this text. Jesus Christ does not say, happy are those who create a nuisance of themselves. Happy are the lazy. Happy are the unethical. Happy are the sloppy. Happy are the irritating. Happy are the arrogant. No. Happy are the harassed who are harassed because they live a godly life. That's what he's saying. Peter actually writes it this way. Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. You are happy because the spirit of of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name, that is in the name Christian. 1 Peter 4, 12 to 16. Would you notice back here that Jesus Christ did not say, Happy are those who are persecuted, period. No. Happy are those who share in the sufferings of Christ because they're living for righteousness' sake. Fourteen former Muslims were now identifying with Christ their Lord in a secret cove along the water's edge in Morocco. As they finished baptizing these 14 converts, suddenly... An observer leapt into the water with tears filling his eyes, declaring that he too wanted to be a follower of Christ and be baptized. This man had been the interpreter for the training meetings that week held by the Christians. In order to be baptized, this Muslim 
had to answer publicly the questions the others had answered before they were immersed. These were the questions they had to answer. Number one, do you renounce Islam, the Quran, Ramadan, and other teachings? Yes. Have you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior? And do you now believe in the Trinity that Christ is equally God? Yes. Are you willing to be imprisoned, to be thrown out of your home for Christ? Upon the answer, yes, then you're prepared to be publicly identified. With this one, you may very well suffer for and with. You know something, friends, no matter what happens to those 15 According to Christ's words, they are on their their way to experiencing true abiding happiness. Let's rehearse these nine statements that define true happiness as we race to a close here. In verse 3, I'll reward them. You follow along. Jesus Christ basically says, blessed are those who recognize they are spiritually poverty-stricken. The world says, by the way, as we contrast each of these, happy are those who can say, I've got it made. In verse 4, Jesus Christ effectively says, blessed are those who mourn over their sinful propensity. While the world would say, happy are those who never have to cry over anything. Verse 5, the Lord effectively said, blessed are those who refuse to retaliate. The world would say, happy are those who know how to climb on top and over everybody on their way to the top. Verse 6, Jesus Christ said, happy are those who are famished for the things of God. The world would say, oh no, no, happy are those who can stuff themselves with the things of life. Jesus Christ says in verse 7, effectively happy are those who lend a hand to help. And the world says, you've got to be kidding. No, happy is the one who never needs help. In verse 8, Jesus shocked his world by saying that the happy person is one whose private purity is a daily resolution. The world would say, oh no, happiness is when your private life never makes it in the newspaper. That's happiness. Verse 9, the world would say, happy are those who know how to tear into pieces. Jesus Christ says, happy are those who make Peace. And finally, in verses 10 and 11, the world concludes their list of me attitudes, and they would summarize it this way Happy are the trouble free. And Jesus Christ says, Happy are those who accept trouble for me. Those who are truly pursuing peace might not mean much to planet Earth. But take heart, one day you will rule the world. Many of you are are old enough to have watched Cassius Clay, a.k.a. Muhammad Ali, box. Former uh, three-time world heavyweight boxing champion. He was the Michael Jordan and Tiger Woods of the the ring. No one could match his skill for years. He, He sort of redefined it all. His face would would be on Sports Illustrated more times than any other athlete in the history of that magazine. When he was floating like a butterfly and stinging like a bee, you remember that? He was on top of his profession and everybody knew it too. He made sure of that. But that was a long time ago. Gary Smith, a sports writer, went to Ali's country estate some time ago to interview him. Gary was met at the door by a bent figure with um, slurred speech, sort of a combination of Parkinson's disease and way, way too many punches. This article said that Ali escorted Gary out to a barn that had become his museum. It was filled with mementos and trophies and life-sized pictures framed with glass of him punching the air and holding championship belts over his head. As he got closer, Gary noticed 
on those large pictures lining the barn wall that had captured Ali at his greatest moments, there were, there were white streaks. Pigeons nesting in the barn had made their own contribution. Ali noticed it too. Gary said he, he scowled up at them. Almost as an act of closure, he shuffled over to the wall and one by one, he turned them and faced them to the wall. And he walked out to the open door of the barn and he stood there looking out across the field, muttering to himself something. Gary said as he walked over, excuse me, I, I, I didn't hear what you said. Ollie repeated louder, this time just not to himself. I was saying I had the world and it was nothing. It was nothing. Those who follow after Jesus Christ will be often underfoot and overlooked. And you will never have the world now. But one day you will. And just knowing that alone, according to Christ and the apostles, brings an abiding sense of happiness no matter what may come. Let it come. One day you will have the world. And you know something? When you have the world one day, it'll be something. It will be something. Happiness now, happiness and heaven forever. With that, we bring this lesson and this series to a close. This daily time in God's Word features the teaching of Stephen Davey. The series we just completed is called Overcoming the Me Attitudes. One of Stephen's most popular books comes from this series and is also called Overcoming the Me Attitudes. We have this resource on sale today. You'll find it online at our website, which is wisdomonline.org. In addition to bringing you these daily Bible lessons, we also have a magazine. It includes articles written by Stephen in which he brings you practical insight on various topics. The magazine also has a daily devotional guide that you can use to remain grounded in God's Word each day. You can sign up for it on our website, or you can call us today. Our number is 866-48-BIBLE, and our website is wisdomonline.org. That's all for today. Join us next time for more wisdom for the heart's.